the beginning and the end. There is none who can be likened unto thee. There is none who can be compared unto thee. The Lord who knows us fully. You know all our infirmities. You know all our weaknesses, loving God of Father. Yet you've loved us even in our weaknesses, loving God of Father. You loved us even when we are still your enemies, Lord. You loved us when we were even still sinners, my loving God of Father. You never cast us away from the beginning when we rebelled against you, Lord. But you've always, from generation to generation, been devising ways to restore us unto thyself, loving God. You are the God who sends your word every morning. The God who awakens us every day to speak unto us, loving God of Father. The Lord who betrothes our hearts unto you, loving God of Father. No one can be compared unto the loving God of Father. You have done excellently, loving God of Father. You have done perfectly, loving God of Father, in seeking us out, my God. Even as they have decided, Lord, seek out your servant. We are like lost sheep, my God. We say the same to the loving God of Father. Seek us out even to them, my God of Father. Draw us close unto you, O King of glory. We give our lives to you, Lord. We surrender all to you. And we say that we love you, my loving God of oh Father. We do not come to you as beggars, my God. But we are coming to the Father who loves us. We are coming to the Father who cares for us, loving God. With this confidence, Father, we come before you. And we say, Father, even today, may you enlighten the eyes of our understanding. That we may know the fullness of our inheritance in Christ. That we may know that which Christ took hold of us, my God. That we will be able, my God of oh Father, to forget the past and press on to take hold of that which Christ took hold of us, my God. That we will come to that place when we will know the exceeding glorious power that you've given us inside of us, my God, to work holiness and righteousness inside of us, Lord. That we will not fear, but we will know that you who called us, you're able to perfect us in the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, even to the Father. Draw us close unto you, loving God. Enlighten the eyes of our understanding, beloved God of Father. Embrace us once again, even today. Take hold of our hand and lead us in the way that we should, talk, we should go in, Father. Lord, I pray that even today, may you send your word and quicken us. May you come and minister unto us, loving God, in the only way that you can do it. Speak to each one of us in the language that we can understand. With the purpose that our hearts will be stirred up. That we would turn away from every idol. Turn away from our wicked ways. Return unto you. That we would do that which you require of us. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we worship you. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father we pray. With thanksgiving. Amen. All the saints say amen hallelujah isn't it not a great day is it not a great blessing for us to wake up even today knowing that we are in the hands of God waking up even today knowing that the Lord is at work in our lives we give him the glory we give him the honor and we give him the praise the God who never grows weary, the God who never faints, the God who is here even today working to renew us, to transform us, to conform us to the image of his son Jesus Christ, that we will walk even in this world as joint heirs, that we will take hold of that which Christ took hold of us. He deserves the glory. He deserves the honor. You have a reason to lift your hands up and tell him thank you Lord if there be anything else today that you can thank God for at least lift your voice up and thank him for salvation thank him for the blood that daily cleanses us thank him for the anointing that breaks the yoke in our life thank him for his goodness you know I remember when the children of Israel used to sing this one song and they were saying the Lord is good and his mercy is endure forever when you wake up in the morning, if you do not have any new song to sing, if you don't know what to say unto whom, just lift your voice and tell him, you know, God, I know that you are good and your mercies endure forever. Hallelujah. We thank God that he, it pleased him to put us in these last days. We thank him. 
for the time that, like this that he has given unto us that he may manifest his glorious glory through us the glory that the world has never seen let me remind you even today the people who know their God they shall be strong and they shall do exploits hallelujah we are in the last days and our purpose is to prepare ourselves to be a people ready to do the will of God we are not just preparing ourselves you know that God prepare me and take me to heaven but we are being prepared that we shall go into the enemy's camp destroy the strongholds of the devil set the captives free declare open eyes to the blind declare healing to the broken hearts we are here for a purpose and a purpose that we shall surely fulfill because the Lord who chose us is faithful and great in mighty and power to fulfill that which he started in our lives hallelujah just to remind you the times that we are in this is the time when God is calling us to return unto himself I was listening again to the message that Apostle John Melinda preached that which was so prophetic when he was standing in a Christian life church and one of the things that touched me even yesterday when I listened was this one thing when he said this is a time not for us to confess sins but this is a time for us to turn away from our wicked ways praise the Lord this is a time not for us just to confess our sins but this is a time for us to turn away from our wicked ways it takes you to come before the Lord and to ask him, Lord, what does it mean for me to turn away from my wicked ways? Because we've spent so much a time in church when we are confessing our sins. We've spent so much a time when we come before him and we tell him, forgive us. And surely he is faithful. He has been always forgiving us. But now when the Lord says no, the time for confession and going back, the time of confession and not determining to turn away from your wicked ways stops here. And the Lord says it is time to advance. It is very, it is very important for you and me to pay heed to the voice of God and to begin to seek unto him and tell him, Lord, help me to know how I can turn away from my wicked ways. And I was looking through all these things and I was like, you know, God, you've not left us in darkness. You've not left us like a people who are ignorant who don't know what to do. But the Lord has been slowly by slowly showing us the way how we can turn away from our wicked ways. He's been showing us the way how we can be strengthened. He's been showing us the way how we can turn unto him and live our lives for him and walk with him. Praise the Lord. All these days we've been talking about as we've been talking about the altar as we've been talking about the seven essentials from last week when Dr. John Melinda was sharing with, uh, with us. We began talking about how to be led by the Holy Spirit. And we are not being led by the Holy Spirit for pleasure. We are not being led by the Holy Spirit to feel good. But there is a, a mission that the Holy Spirit comes to do in our lives. When you talk about being led by the Holy Spirit, you cannot separate it from the cross. You cannot separate it from dying to self. You cannot separate it from surrender. Because the Holy Spirit comes in our lives after we have given our lives to Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. He comes so that he can help us to put to death the old nature. Praise the Lord. Remember what we shared. Even when you go back into the series, you hear Dr. John Melinda emphasizing it. That when we got saved, we received a new life. Even just like the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Those who are in Christ Jesus, they are new creatures. Behold, old things have gone out, have passed away, and behold, all things are new. But there is a mystery. There is something here that I want you always to pray for. And this thing has been unfolding in my life continually. Every time when I, I go back and meditate on it, every time when I hear Apostle John Melinda teaching about it, it deeper and deeper goes inside of me and then it amazes me what is that thing that amazes me this is something that he said you know i had never known this truth even as i was living with the lord but i remember when he began teaching us and telling us when we received christ as our lord and savior we received a new life our spirits of course the holy spirit came as we've been teaching he came into our spirit and quickened our spirits that were dead by him indwelling inside of us 
And when he dwelt inside of us, we became one spirit with him. Just like I was telling you, we do not have two spirits, but we have one spirit. But after the Holy Spirit dwelling into, inside of us, we ask ourselves, okay, if I'm a new creature, if I'm a new creature, where is the new life? that Jesus gave unto me. Why am I struggling? But there is this thing that I pray God will open your eyes that you may understand it. That when we got saved, the new life that Jesus gave unto us at us on the day when we were born again, that life is not in us. That life is not in this body of clay. That, body, that life is not in us. We do not have it here. The life, the new life that belongs to us, that our new self, that our new self that Jesus gave unto us, it is perfect. That life is not in this mortal body. It is not in this body of clay. That life is hid in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. And I remember when he was speaking unto us and telling us what Paul said. When Paul said, I know that which have entrusted unto my Lord, he will keep it until that day. What was Paul saying that he has entrusted unto the Lord? He was saying that new life that the Father gave unto me through the Son. The Father gave me a new life when I believed in His Son, Jesus Christ. But that new life is not in me. That life is in Christ Jesus in the higher places where He is seated in the heavenly realm at the right hand of the Father. That is where my new life is. It is not here. So, okay, if that new life is not here, He gave me a new life. And when he gave me this new life, he said, this is your life. The father gave me a new life. And the father says, this is your life. And I say, thank you, father, for the new life. And then Jesus says, father, this life is not going to be in this body of clay. It is so glorious. It is so glorious. And Jesus says, no, I'm going to keep this in heaven for them. I'm going to keep this where the enemy cannot touch it. I'm going to keep it where it cannot be defiled. I'm going to keep it where it cannot be corrupted. I am going to be the steward of this new life as long as they are still putting on these mortal bodies I'm going to keep this life for them do you see that and then Jesus took that new life and he took it and it is in him in the heavenly places okay Jesus the new gift the precious life the inheritance that the father has given unto us that glorious beautiful perfect self that he has given unto us now you've taken it in heaven and yet you're leaving us here on earth and you're telling us we are in the world but we are not in the world yes the Holy Spirit is in us but how are we going to be able to leave Jesus because we still have this old self. We still have this old man inside of us. Yes, the Holy Spirit in, is in us. But Jesus, you know that our natural man, this old man, is so rebellious. He does not understand the things of God. As long as we have this old man, we cannot know the things of God. We cannot obey. We are in enmity with God. So Jesus... It's like I see myself pleading before the Lord and telling him, Jesus, my new life, you're taking it and you're saying you're going to keep it. So if you leave me here and you say I have to be your ambassador and you say I have to be your witness. So Jesus, how am I going to leave? How am I going to be here and do the will of the Father as you did it? And Jesus says, mm -mm, don't worry. Don't care about that. So what has to be done? Jesus said, my, I'm giving you my very life. The one that, the new life, I'm keeping it. But the one which is going to be in you right now, it is me who is going to be in you. It is my life. It is me who is going to indwell in you. And you know what Jesus says? Just give me your body. I am I am going to make it my temple. And he says, give me your soul. And I'm going to dwell in you. And that is what Paul says. And he says, you know, beloved, I no longer live. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The Bible says somewhere, I think it is in Ephesians, that if we died together with Christ and rose up with him, then our minds should be set on the things that are above and not on the things below. Because we died with him, we rose with him, and our lives now are hid in Christ in the heavenly places. Oh God. Lord, I pray, may you open our eyes to understand this mystery.
Lord, I pray, may you open our eyes to know that we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. Lord, help us to know that the life we have right now in us, it is not our life, but it is the life of Christ. Help us to understand that it is Christ who is to live right now. In Jesus' name, amen. It is my prayer that God will open your eyes. It is my prayer that you may understand this mystery. Beloved, then we say, yes, Christ is now inside of me. Christ is my life. Christ is my righteousness. Christ is my wisdom. Christ is my understanding. Christ is my sanctification. He is everything that I am. It is his life that is inside of me. You know, something, I think of this. When you get to know that you no longer live, and it is the life of Christ that is inside of you, and then you begin to think and say, if Christ was here today, what, what, what would he do? What, how would, what, what is the mind of Christ? Because the Bible tells us that we have the mind of Christ, which means if we have the mind of Christ, remember what is in the mind. If we have the mind of Christ, it means we have the will of Christ, it means we have the emotions of Christ, and it means we have the intellect of Christ. Hallelujah. When the Bible just tells you, you who are believers, you have the mind of Christ. The carnal mind is in the nemeter with God. But you who have believed, you have the mind of Christ. What does it mean for me to have the mind of Christ? It means you have the wisdom of Christ. Christ has become your wisdom. It means you have the emotions of Jesus Christ. You no longer live according to those old corrupt emotions and then you have the will of Jesus the will does, that does not debate, debate with the father the will in which there is no reasoning against the God the will that does not rebel against the father the will that is completely yielded unto him so if Christ is inside of me like that, if I have the mind of Jesus, which means I have his will, I have his intellect, his wisdom, and I have his emotions, then why am I not living a life that glorifies God? This is where it happens. The Holy Spirit is inside of us. We have the life of Christ inside of us. But beloved, to live for the life of Christ to be manifest in our lives, for us to walk in the life of Christ, it is not it doesn't just happen anyhow. It doesn't just happen magically. It takes a daily choice. Hallelujah. It takes a daily choice. This is where the struggle comes in. This is what the Bible says in Galatians where we've been reading again and again. Where the Bible says the spirit and the carnal mind, the spirit and the flesh are in conflict. Why? Because myself is still here. My flesh is still here. The old man is still here. And the Bible has told us in Romans 8, this old man who is in me is in enmity with God. Let me tell you, we still have this kind of man inside of us. We have this old man. We have the old nature. And the Bible clearly says this kind of nature is in enmity with God. This kind of nature cannot please the Lord. It cannot obey God and it can never submit to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. This old man cannot know the things of God. He does not understand the things of God. He doesn't desire the things of God. He doesn't love the things of God. It is impossible for this man to obey the laws of God. And he's inside of me. Christ is there. But this kind of man is inside of me. The Holy Spirit is with me. But there is a battle. This old man is saying, I am not submitting. I am not going to do the will of God. I cannot even do it. The kind of man, the old man in me is saying, the standard of God is too high. The ways of God are so high. I cannot walk in those ways. It is even impossible for anyone to walk like that. Who is that one reasoning? It is the old man inside of me. It is impossible. It is impossible for the kind of man to submit to God. It is impossible. So now, how do we live for God? This is why the Holy Spirit comes. And the Holy Spirit says, I know the stubbornness of that old nature. 
And I know it will rebel even unto death. And I know it hates God and it will never submit unto God. So when the Holy Spirit comes to me, the Holy Spirit is telling me, Nora, I'm not here to pamper this, this old man. I'm here to put him to death. Oh God, you're so glorious. You're so awesome. The Holy Spirit does not come to teach the old man in me. To obey God. I pray God will open your eyes to understand this. I pray God will give you revelation of this. The Holy Spirit does not come to teach the old man in me to obey God. The old man does, I mean the Holy Spirit does not come in me to make the old man, to entice him, to, 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 to force him, to cause him. Uh -uh. The Holy Spirit says, Nora, I want you to know this. Inside of you, there is the old man. Inside of me, there is, inside of you, there is this Adamic nature. But Nora, I want you to know, this nature in you will never submit to God. It will never appreciate the things of God. It will never know God. It cannot even understand the things of God. It is rebellious, 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 even unto death. And then the Holy Spirit tells me, Nora, I'm here to help you to put this thing to death. We are not here to transform it. We are not here to try to, to smear it. We are not here to make it to say, you know, we can help the old man to obey God. We can help the old man to do the will of God. No, Jesus, the Holy Spirit says, I'm here to put him to death. I'm here to crucify him. I'm here to put him to death. That is why Paul says, I die daily. I die daily because that is the work of the Holy Spirit that he comes to do in me. He says, I have come not to help the old man, but I have come to put that old man to death. I've come to separate you from that Adamic nature. I've come to crucify him. And you know what the Holy Spirit says? The Holy Spirit says, you know, we've got to do this work day by day. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory be to the most high God who is faithful, whose ways are so mysterious. The Lord who has given us this great and marvelous salvation. Glory be to his name. The Lord whose ways are not our ways. The Lord who is marvelous in his working. The Lord who has given us this mysterious salvation which the angels do not understand. Even we unto whom it has been given, it is beyond the human comprehension. Glory and honor be unto his holy name now and forever. Beloved, if we can understand this, and our prayer would be, God, help me to separate my soul from the canon nature. Help me to deliver me. We are talking about the time comes, beloved, and we are talking about the deliverance of the soul. The deliverance of my soul. Sometimes when we talk about deliverance, we so quickly think about casting out demons. Beloved, it is so easy to cast out a demon. It is so easy to rebuke the demon and it goes. In just a twinkle of an eye, you command it in the name of Jesus. I command you in Jesus' name, go and the demon will go. But let me tell you, you cannot bind the old man in you. You cannot cast the old man in you. You cannot tell the Adamic nature in you, I bind you old man and now I command you get out of me. Mm -mm. The old man is not rebuked. The old man cannot be bound. The old man cannot be cast out like a demon. Uh -uh. The old man has to be put to death. The old man has to be crucified. The old man has to be put to death daily. Beloved, that is where the battle of salvation now is. Remember when we were looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Verse, is it 6 or 8? Let's go and see it. 2 Corinthians. And the Bible so clearly says it. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. The Bible says, for which cause we faint not, but Though the outward man perishes, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The outward man, this outward man perishes, but the inward man, the inward man 
is being renewed day by day. When we are talking about the inward man, we are talking about the soul. The Bible is saying our soul has to be renewed day by day. How is the soul renewed day by day? The soul is every day we are going through deliverance. Every day we are going in through deliverance. Not deliverance from demons, but the soul is being delivered from the old nature. The soul is being delivered from the old man. And let me tell you, we have seen battles. You talk about the first world war. You talk about the second world war. You talk about the wars in the world that you think about any war that you, th you, you, you can think about. In Uganda, we have known so many wars. But let me tell you, there is no war that is as fierce as the war between the spirit and the old nature. There is no war. That is, there is no battlefield where there is such a fierce battle. You know, we talk about, you think about Somalia and you said the, the battle, the war has been there for five years. The war has been there for six years. These world wars have seasons, they come and they end. We have had wars in Uganda, they come and end. But let me tell you, we have a battlefield inside of us. And the war that is taking place inside of me, this war does not cease. It is a war that is going on day and night. I wish God will open your eyes and you know that. The war between the spirit and the old man. The old man is so stubborn. The old man, you know God says his neck is like a bronze and snow. He has hardened his flint. He does not accept his sin. He does not accept to repent. Even when he says, I'm sorry, it is hypocrisy. The old nature, the old man never accepts that I've done wrong. The old man will always find an excuse. Even when he says he's sorry, this is the, his attitude. He will say, let me say I'm sorry just, because, just to make you happy. But inside, the person who is carnal, the person who is in this old nature and it is ruling inside of him, I, said, I just said sorry just to please him. You know, I just said sorry because I wanted peace in the house. I just said sorry just because I didn't want the battle to go on. But what? When he's inside, he said, mm -mm, I didn't do anything wrong. I know I am innocent and I know I'm not wrong. Let me tell you, the old man will never repent. The old man will never accept his weakness, his sin, his rebellion. He will always give an excuse. And this old man says, God, God, you also know. You're not pointing a finger in God. That is what the old man does. He says, God, you know, your ways are hard. No man can keep your ways. I cannot live according to your ways. And even when he returns to God, you know when man is afflicted, when man, when God, when man does all the wickedness and then God brings turmoil, he brings pestilences, he brings the feminine, he brings all the pain. The old man feels the pain when the body is touched. Anything, talk about anger, talk about sickness, talk about pestilence. The old man loves this body. He loves the body so much. He loves this body so much because he knows where there is no body. He has no where he's going to stay. So he loves this body. So anything that touches this body, it touches him. It touches the old man. So he will fight to see that he protects this body so that he can remain living. You understand what I'm saying? And the other thing is, when God brings the affliction because of the rebellion of the old nature, when God brings the pestilences, when God brings the feminine and all those things that he brings because his anger is being provoked by this old man, do you know what the old man says? He humbles himself. But it's not real humility. God told the children of Israel and he said, Judah has returned unto me, but in hypocrisy. Judah has returned unto me, but not with all his heart. That is the way out the canon man. He even dares to deceive God. He even dares to walk in hypocrisy before God. That's what the Bible says. Cast be a man who trusts in the arm of flesh. Cast be someone who trusts in the canon man. You, I mean, it's like you don't really understand that man. 
He even dares to lie to God. And he comes before God and says, you know, God, I'm sorry. You know, God, forgive me. But it is carnality. It can even, it stirs up all its motions. Tears can even flow. It can roll down and says, you know, God, have mercy on me. Forgive me. You know, God in his mercy says, okay, I love the man. I know that that is not true. But let me lift up. Let me lift up this pain. Let me lift up this affliction. Maybe you'll understand and begin to seek me. Maybe you'll understand and cry unto me. But you know what happens? After God takes away the pain, after God takes away the affliction, the old man says, eh, eh, banangi, it is over. Let me go back in my ways right now. Do you see what fellow did? That is just a manifestation of the old nature. It is just the manifestation of the rebellious nature that is inside of us. Praise the Lord, beloved. We are dealing with something, as the Bible has clearly told us in Romans chapter 8, we are dealing with a nature that will never obey God. We are dealing with a nature that will never glorify God. We have a nature inside of us that is completely in a nemeter with God. And the only solution that God has given unto us, the Lord says, you know, that nature needs to be put to death. The old man needs to be put to death. The soul, your soul, my soul, has to be delivered from this, the influence, from the bondage of this old man. My soul needs to be delivered from the bondage of this old man. And the issue is, there are, time when I used, there are times when I was working in salvation and I could not separate the soul from the old man. I thought my soul is the old man. Of course, these two are one. Just like the spirit, the Holy Spirit and the spirit of man, they are one. You understand? Just like the Holy Spirit and the spirit of man are one. When the Holy Spirit comes in, the two are one. Even so, the old man and the, the flesh, they are one. But you know, the Bible says the word of God is so powerful. The Holy Spirit is so powerful. It is him alone. He is able to separate the soul from the flesh. He is able to deliver the soul from the flesh. Because God did not create, the God who created this soul for us. I was today reading the, 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 the scripture, I don't remember it is, but it is in Jeremiah. Where the Bible says, the Lord God who created this soul for us. When God created this soul, he, there was no sin. When God created my soul, there was no rebellion. When God created my soul, there was no wickedness therein. So the soul was complete. It was perfect. It had no sin inside of it. It, it was innocent. It didn't know any wickedness. My soul, when God created it, it was good. It was pure. Praise the Lord. So the flesh came in. The old man came in. The old nature came in. Which means it is possible to separate the soul from the old man. But only God can do that. Just like you see that when the spirit comes into your spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes into the, the human spirit. The two become so one. They are, so, they are one the same way. When the old man came into my soul, when he came into our soul, when we fell away from God and this nature came inside of us, this old man became so one with God that there is nothing that can separate the old man. There is nothing humanly. There is nothing scientifically. There is nothing philosophically. There is nothing psychologically. There is nothing, nothing that can separate my soul from the old nature. There is nothing that can separate my soul from this rebellious nature. Psychology cannot do it. Science cannot do it. Talk about any kind of psychology, philosophy. Talk about anything. Talk about anything that the world has. Nothing, no science, no psychology, no anything, no meditation, no nothing that can separate my soul from the rebellious nature. The only one who can do that work, it is the Holy Spirit. The only one who knows how to do that work, it is the Holy Spirit. Now, beloved, when you neglect, when we neglect the Holy Spirit, then who is going to help us? 
If we don't know how to trade softly with him, then who is going to deliver us? Who is going to help to deliver us from this rebellious nature? If we do not cry unto God to teach us how to walk in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, let me ask you, who is going to help us to deliver us? Beloved, we are in a generation today where many of us have neglected the Holy Spirit. Many of us have despised him. Many of us have lost the fellowship with him. And yet we are using everything else to say, okay, we are going to try other things to try to deliver the soul from rebellion. And what do we do? We use different things. We have brought psychology into the church. We have brought even transcendental meditation into the church. We have brought yoga into the church. We are trying to use all the things. We have brought scientific, there is science of the science of the soul. There is the, the, the science of salvation. There is a religion I know it is called, is it science of salvation? So people are trying, after you, we neglect the Holy Spirit, we try everything else. We we have tried psychology, we have tried science, we have brought all the things into the church, yoga, but none of those things will be able to separate us from the rebellious nature. And when we become so religious, some of us, you know what we do? We begin to make vows. And we say, okay, if the Holy Spirit is not here to lead me, if Holy Spirit, I don't want to you to lead me because I have to depend on you. I want to be independent. So what am I going to do? I'm going to show you that I'm strong. If God wants me to obey his words, I'm going to do it now. I have no, I have no need now. I'm going to do it. And you know what we do? We begin to use vows. We begin to swear as, as Peter swore. Peter was in the flesh. He was in his kind of mind. And he was like, Jesus, I swear, even if it means to die with you, I'm going to die with you. Even if it means to go with you, even up to the cross, I'm going to do it. And Jesus was seeing the flesh. He was seeing the flesh and Jesus was like, flesh, you cannot do that. Flesh, you can't do that. Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you, before the cock crows three times today, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter could not believe it. Beloved, when we, are not, when we neglect the Holy Spirit, when we grieve the Holy Spirit, we begin to bring in, we begin to devise so many ways. We have brought so many things in the church, but all the things we have brought in have not delivered people from rebellion. We have turned our, our churches like into disco halls. There are so many lights. I, I don't say all those things are bad. But we are trying to say, okay, people don't concentrate in worship. Now what can we do? We want the people to worship in spirit and truth. So what can we do? Maybe we should bring some lights. Maybe we should bring some disco lights. Maybe we should bring some glittering things in the church. Maybe that will help them when they come into the church. Then they will concentrate. Let me tell you, people come in the church with all the glamour we have put there, with all the disco lights we have put there, with all the big, big systems we have put there, the stereos in the music and everything's boo, boo, the lights, everything looks so glorious. And you know what? Still man cannot worship in spirit and truth without the Holy Spirit. Still we don't. Still you put all those things there and people will be there and their minds are still loitering because the kind of man, mind that's what it does. He's moving to and fro. He's moving up and down in the earth. He is in the church. He visits his children. He visits the grandmother. He goes to the grave. He goes to the market. He goes to, to shop right. He goes to the arcade. He goes to the washing bay. He goes into the garage. You are there in church but he, for him he says, mm -mm, me I'm like my father, the devil. And that's what the rebellious, you remember when, when Satan came before Jesus, before God in heaven and God told Satan, where have you come from? And the devil says, ah, I've been moving to and fro in all the, the whole earth. So that is the father of this rebellious nature. This is the father of the old Adamic nature inside of us. As his father moves to and fro in all the world, even this rebellious nature is moving to and fro. That is why those who are carnal, when they come in church, people who are carnally minded, your mind cannot concentrate for five minutes. You cannot concentrate. The moment you begin to sing, the mind says, ah, me, I'm not, I'm not used to these things of being still. Stillness belongs to the children of God. Stillness belongs to the Holy Spirit. Me, I can't sit here for five minutes. Okay, the body is here. I allow you to be here with the people. Let the people see you. But me, I have to take a ride now. 
and you are there in church and immediately you run and, and the mind goes to the garage. It goes into the kitchen and says, okay, when we finish church, you're going to mix that flour and put in that cauliflower and then you put in the salt. Do you see that cake, how it is going to look? You are in church and worshiping and then you are seeing the cake and you say, oh, I can't wait getting out of this church to go back home and prepare this cake. But you have prepared the cake in church. Why? Because the kind of mind was in the kitchen. And then you run to the supermarket and then you begin to say, okay, you begin to see everything in the supermarket and you say, oh, I didn't even remember I don't have that. Okay, don't you remember we also don't have papers? Don't you have, we don't have toilet papers? Don't you remember we also need some green paper? Don't you remember you also need a lotion? Don't you remember you also need some toothpaste? So you are in the church, but you are in the arcade, you are in the supermarket shopping. And at the end of the service, you begin, oh, I can't wait getting out of here to go. But how much money is it going to cost? Someone is in a church, but the carnal mind will never be still. Carnal mind will never concentrate on the things of God. Beloved, and no one can teach carnality to concentrate. I say that to tell you that we have put all the things in the church, but we cannot make people to concentrate in church unless we draw the presence of the Holy Spirit. Unless the Holy Spirit will cry unto him and his presence hovers in our congregations. That is when people begin to concentrate. It is him who helps us to concentrate. It is him who helps us to see Jesus. It is him who helps us to see the Lord. Him alone. But if we are not able to make our churches into altars, if we are not able to make our churches into altars, where the presence of God is feeling, let me tell you, beloved, we are laboring in vain. Why? Because the nature, this old man will never concentrate. This old man will never worship the Lord. He is so rebellious. And that is, do you now understand, when the Holy Spirit comes to us, he says, mm -mm, you need deliverance. And he says, can you agree with me that we can put to death this old nature? You know, it's like when you go in the hospital ward and the doctor says, I want to remove this tumor, but they have to cut you. Sometimes they have to put you under anesthesia. They are, sometimes it is painful, but the doctor says, I have to cut you and remove this tumor. You understand what I'm saying? So the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to operate you. I'm going to work on you. And you say, how long is it going to take, Lord? And he said, this is a daily work. Hallelujah. Lord, for how long is this going to be done? He says, mm -mm, we are doing this day by day. So I want you every day to come to me. I want you every day to yield unto me. And not only that, we come to a place when the Holy Spirit, when we begin to yield day by day, he takes us to another level and he tells us, because beloved, this thing is so deep, so wicked, so dark, so it's beyond. Only God can explain the wickedness of it and the deceitfulness of it. A time comes when the Holy Spirit, you know what? Now we are going to do this operation moment by moment. I'm operating you moment by moment. I'm separating you moment by moment. There are moments when you're talking like this and then you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and he's telling you, mm -mm, right there, first, close your mouth and stop what you're saying. Sometimes we say, if I stop, what would the people say right now? And that's what the flesh is telling you. The Holy Spirit is telling you, stop right now that conversation. And then the, the old man speaks and says, what will people think about you? People will think you're proud. People will be offended. And then inside of you immediately there is a battle. You are either going to yield to the Holy Spirit and then you keep quiet. And then the people around you will say, you are saying a point. Why have you kept quiet? And then you may say, okay. You see, you see what I told you? People now, you're, you're bringing people into confusion. Now people don't understand. And say, okay, okay. I think I felt like I didn't want to say this. I felt like I wasn't supposed to say it. Because you felt the conviction. Say, but anyway, okay, let me just say it because you want to hear it. And immediately the Holy Spirit is grieved. And the flesh is like, yeah, I've got it. Yeah, all the demons, all the powers of darkness clap their hands and say yes we have got it yes we have won the battle yes the goal belongs to us in the, immediately in this conversation the enemy says the goal is mine and they all shout and that is blasphemy to the Lord 
It is blaspheming. God says my name is being blasphemed continually when we rebel. How do they how do we cause the name of the Lord to be blasphemed? Whenever we yield unto the old man, the demons are cheering up. You know, just like you can be in a football game and there are two teams. We are in a football team where there are two teams and they are in the fight. We have the, the demons, the, the, the old nature has its supporters, the demons and all the evil angels. And then the Holy Spirit in, with our spirit also has his team, the angels and Jesus Christ and Father in heaven. So now when we are fighting and the Holy Spirit says, no turn this side, and the flesh says, no turn this side, the whole heaven is now watching who is going to get the goal, who is going to get into the net right now whose will is going to be done right now whose voice is going to be glorified right now wow, whose voice and everything in just a moment but the whole heaven is there watching whose voice is going to be glorified now who is going to be glorified right here and then the battle begins and the flesh is saying don't do that don't do that think about your reputation think about what people will think about you and he's just telling you please let the goal go decide and the Holy Spirit is telling you but you know what the word says for him he doesn't strive he's gentle so sweet so humble he says but you know what the word says like this the word says that God hates deceptive, a deceptive tongue. He hates lies. And then you say, hmm, I know. But then the flesh immediately says, you know what? If you do that, you are in danger. And then immediately you say, you know, God, you understand. You really understand. But you know, God, I'll come to you and I repent. And then you give the gold to the devil. And what happens? The demons, the principality, they begin to cheer up and they say, yes, devil, you are God right now. Yes, devil, you have taken the march. Yes, God, devil, you have taken it. And that is what is blaspheming the name of the Lord. And they say, where is their God? Why can't he help them? He said they will live in victory. He said the sons of God overcome the world. Now where is their victory? Now where is their God who told them they will, they will help them? That is what they are doing. What are they? They are blaspheming the word of God. They are blaspheming the name of the Lord. And what happens? Do you think the Holy Spirit will be excited in you when the name of the Lord is being blasphemed? When the name of, when the word of God is being reduced? When the word of God is being spoken evil of? Do you, see, do you think the Holy Spirit will rejoice? He is grieved. He feels so bad. He feels the anger. He feels the anger of the Lord. He sees how the Father is being provoked. You understand what I'm saying? And that is where the battle is. So every time we come into such an instance, the Holy Spirit say, speaks and then the flesh also speaks. The angels wait. And even the angels say, oh. The angels also are grieved. They enter into the same sorrow that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in. But when we do the will of God, all heavens, remember what the Bible says that when one sinner repents, that the angels in heaven also cheer up. They rejoice. They give a shout. They say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy. Holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The Lord who is able to deliver his people. The Lord who has delivered his people from the power of sin. The Lord who has destroyed the works of the devil. They bow down and worship. And the whole heaven is filled with a praise. Why? Because you made the right choice. But how many times are we walking when the one who is being cheered, when the cheering in the heavenly realm, in the spiritual world, it is the devil saying, I'm taking the lead even today. I'm taking the lead even today. He even waits for you when you're sleeping. And he says, even when you're sleeping, I'm taking the lead. You dream when you're doing wicked things. You dream when you're fighting with people. You dream when you're killing. You dream when you're worshipping idols. And the devil says, I don't only take the lead when you are awake, I will also take the lead when you are sleeping. Do you see how the Holy Spirit is grieved? Beloved, we are talking about this thing. As God is telling us, we are in a battle. As Galatians have told us, we are in the battle. The battle is between the spirit and the flesh. The Holy Spirit is here telling us if you yield to the flesh, you cannot please God. And if you ignore the Holy Spirit, and then you say, I'm going to work out my own salvation in my own strength. You don't have a strength in you. 
the strength of the carnal man, the strength of the soul under bondage of carnality cannot fulfill the righteousness of God. Praise the Lord. Allow me even as I wind up, just to show you this one demonstration and then we close up and then we are going to pray. Remember when we used our demonstration here and we were trying to look at the spirit, the soul, and then we were looking at the body. And we looked at this and we said, at creation, God created man. This is just for demonstration. We cannot even really in the fullness bring out the mystery of salvation. But we try to use some aids just to say, can we get more understanding? So even as we were saying, we decided, let's look, use this little demonstration. And we looked at this and we said that creation, God created a perfect man, the spirit, and then the soul and the body. And we saw this was the perfect man. And then we saw that when man fell and then he fell away from God and we fell from the glory of God, something happened to man. The fallen man, the man turned out and this is what happened to man. The soul of man that was pure and perfect was turned into something else and then it became sinful. And not only that, when the soul became sinful, the spirit of the Lord left man. Remember, this was full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit left man, and then man remained an empty soul. He became an empty tin, nothing inside of him. So this is the natural man. This is the fallen man. He is full of wickedness, deceitful. And then his soul, his spirit is dead. There is nothing there. This man is fully given unto wickedness, perfectly given unto rebellion. And then we said, when we get born again, something happens to us. The Holy Spirit comes inside of us, as 1 Corinthians says, this which was empty, when the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, this is what happens. We become new creatures. New creature in that the Holy Spirit comes again and fills our spirits. And the spirit of man and the spirit of God become one. What is born of the spirit is the spirit. And that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So the Holy Spirit and the spirit of man, they become one. Now this is where the battle begins. This is what I've been talking about. Now this man, this is whom we call the carnal man. The other one with an empty spirit is not carnal, it's natural. The Bible, when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he differentiates between the natural man and the carnal man. The carnal man is the one who has the spirit of God, but he still walks in the flesh. He is not yet transformed, is not yet renewed. He is not yet conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And this is where now we begin to work, where we begin to seek the Lord, where we begin to yield unto the Lord to seek for the transformation. The Holy Spirit begins to tell us, I can separate you from this flesh. I can separate your soul from rebellion. I can separate your soul from deception because you can put this old man to death and the Jesus Christ will become your mind. You will have the mind of Jesus. And we say that having the mind of Jesus means you have his intellect, you have his emotions, and you have his will. But this does not happen in one day. This happens continually. Praise the Lord. We were looking and then we said, there is what we call the goodness of the flesh. What Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 3, the righteousness of man, which doesn't last for long. How can that be? I was thinking of it. When you look at this man here, When we look at this, when you look at this as the soul, this is a man in the first illustration, we saw when the word of God was coming into this man. We saw when the spirit of God was cleansing, purifying and sanctifying this man. And now we saw how much of the wickedness went out. But when you look at this man, he is settled. He's not perfect. The, all the evil is settled in him, but he is still walking in faith. And the Holy Spirit says, we are going to do this work slowly by slowly. Daily come unto me. Daily wait upon the Lord. And as you wait upon the Lord, you'll be transformed. Praise the Lord. This man who is settled like this, the wickedness is inside there. But he can speak good. He can try to be good. He can try to do some things that are good. But the only thing is the goodness of the natural man has limits he is good when he's too far away but when any shaking comes this that you see which is so pure like this when any shaking comes this man wants his peace 
This is a man if he's like this and then he's no longer walking in the spirit and no longer seeking the Lord, but then he's settled like this. He says, I don't want anything that disturbs my peace. I don't want anything that disturbs my joy. I don't want anything that worries me. He is in his comfort zone. He is no longer seeking the Lord. He has lost the fellowship, but there is, he is, he is, he is, his wickedness is settled down there. When you look at him, he is so religious, you may think he's good. But if you want to know, let the shakings come. Let some things come and discomfort his peace. Let things begin to happen in the way he didn't expect. The business that has become his God, let him be shaken. And then this man now is going to begin to be shaken. That which was settled is going to begin to raise up. That which was settled is going to begin to raise up. The, any idol that he's been having, when the idol is being touched, this man is now being shaken. He's being shaken. Fear begins to come in. Anxiety begins to come in. He begins to lose what he called the praise. The shakings are coming. And the more the shakings are coming, the goodness now begins to disappear. When the shakings increase and God says you have refused to seek me, I'm going to shake and shake. I'm going to shake and shake. When the shakings come, they manifest that which was settled down. Look at this which was clean. It's now all dark. What does this tell us? It brings us back to the book of Amos chapter 5 and 4 where the Lord says, seek me and live. Seek me continually. David says in Psalms 27, seek the Lord and seek him continually. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter uh, in Proverbs chapter 8 is it th verse 35 where the Lord says blessed is he who waits at my doors daily those who continually wait upon the Lord beloved we should never come to a place where we say I don't I, I'm settled I don't want anything that disturbs me I'm just going to live my life no when we begin to settle and we begin to not to seek the Lord and we lose the fellowship with the Holy Spirit, God is going to bring the shakings. And when the shakings come, the worst that has been down inside of us is going to be manifest. Is this man not born again? No, he's born again. But the problem with him is one, he stopped waiting upon the Lord. He stopped seeking the Lord. He becomes so busy with ministry. She becomes so busy with the family. She becomes so busy with the business. She becomes so busy with his trade that he lost the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. He had no more time to do those things that helps him to bring him into fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He stopped to do those things that help the Holy Spirit to help him to put the old man to death. So what happens? He goes back into the old ways. He goes back into the things that he used not to do. The enemy begins to afflict him. Sometimes if we don't repent in time, even the hedge of God up around us is taken away. And the enemy begins to afflict us. He begins to steal because for him he comes to steal, to kill and destroy. If we don't repent in time, the enemy will begin to steal away everything. That's why God says in Revelation, many things have been stolen away from you, but keep that which is still remaining. And if that doesn't happen, if we don't repent in time, what happens? The enemy will kill everything and afterwards he will destroy us. Praise the Lord. Beloved, I pray that God will open our eyes. That we may understand that when God is daily calling us to himself, it is not law. It is not to control us. It is for our good because he wants to deliver us. He wants to conform us to the image of, our son, of his son, Jesus Christ. Just like Paul said to the Galatians chapter 4, that my little children whom I travail for until Christ shall be formed in you. Let this be your cry. Travail. Lay down your life. Cry unto God. Tell him, Lord, help me to yield unto the Holy Spirit until when Christ shall be formed in me, until when I will be delivered from this old nature but as I wind up I want to tell you that this is a lifetime job and because it is a lifetime process of being transformed and being delivered from the flesh that is why seeking God is not a luxury neither is it a seasonal thing but it is a lifetime duty 
Seeking God is a lifetime duty for those who are going to continue in the faith and walk from faith to faith and walk from glory to glory. Seeking God is not a luxury, neither is it a seasonal thing, but it is a lifetime duty to those who say they are going to continue in the faith, fight the good fight of faith, move from glory to glory, and let their sh light shine more and more until the perfect day. The people want to live in such a life, seeking God becomes our first profession. Seeking God becomes our daily duty. Seeking God becomes the top on our list. Not weekly, not on the weekend, but it is a daily duty. Then in such a way, we will be strong, we will live for God, we will bear fruit, and fruit that shall remain. Hallelujah. I just want you to close your eyes, and we are going to talk to God even right now. One thing that I want us to pray unto God today is that God help me to be diligent. Help me to diligently seek you. David said in Psalms 27, Lord, when you said seek him, my face, my heart said, Lord, your face will I seek. I just want you to lift your voice even right now and talk unto the Lord. Just lift your voice even right now and tell him, Father, help me understand the salvation that has been given unto me. Help me to understand how to walk with the Holy Spirit. Help me to understand how to daily yield unto him. Help me to cooperate with him so well for he is here to help me to deliver me from this old man. Woe unto me, O wretched man who shall deliver me from this flesh. But the Holy Spirit is here for the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is here to set us free. What the law could not do because it was weak the Spirit of God is here to do in us today that Christ will be glorified in us. Lift your voice and talk unto him even right now. Lord, we give you praise and glory and we give you honor. We thank you for your word, my loving God of oh Father, because you're giving us deeper understanding, deeper revelation. You're reminding us of the truth of the Bible. You are unveiling unto us to understand our inheritance in Christ Jesus. You're helping us to understand this journey of salvation and how to walk with you. Father, we thank you for the new life that you've given unto us that is hid in Christ Jesus. And we give you glory because we know it is kept where the enemy cannot touch it, loving God. God. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you've given unto us as a seal, as a guarantee of our salvation. He who dwells inside of us. And we thank you for the life of Jesus Christ that you've given unto us, loving God, that we will be able to glorify you in these mortal bodies. King of glory, Father, we pray, may you continually enlighten the eyes of our understanding that we may understand this mysterious salvation that has been given unto us, Lord. Open the eyes of our understanding as you fill us with the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding, loving God of oh Father, that we will be able to yield unto the Holy Spirit, the one you've given unto us to help us to put to death this old nature. For he is here to work a deep and perfect deliverance in our souls, separating us from the old nature. Father, teach us how to yield unto you. Teach us how to yield unto the Holy Spirit. Teach us how to be led by your Spirit. Because you began the good work in us, Father, and we know that you are able to accomplish it. We give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor because you are the faithful God. No one can be likened unto thee. No one can be compared unto thee. All the glory, all the honor, and all the praise belong to you. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. May the Lord bless you so much. Let us meet once again this evening in our evening service. We love you so much and greetings from Apostle John Melinda.